Hello everyone. Today I'm aiming to provide advice regarding how best to distinguish the three British and Irish species of fragrant orchid, Gymnodenia. I promise to do so in the second of this match pair of talks, but first I feel that I should explain to you why I think that three species of fragrant orchid occur in Britain and Ireland, and why I believe that it's well worth making a serious effort to map them adequately. Gymnodenia is the kind of genus that really appeals to biologists. It contains a manageable number of species distributed across Europe, but they, between them, show a wide range of variation in of several different properties, floral morphology, vegetative morphology, pollination syndromes, habitat preferences, flowering times, chromosome numbers, all of these different properties vary considerably. So not surprisingly, this, uh, this genus has uh, experienced a lot of research using techniques such as morphometrics on the morphology, and in particular using DNA to actually determine the boundaries of the different species and to work out how those species are related to each other. If we look at the variation that I've shown on this particular screen, we could crudely apportion these species to two different categories based on spur length. Those outlined in green, which include all of the British and Irish species, are long spurred. They have spurs at least 10 millimeters in length. Whereas there are other species in Europe where the spurs are typically less, often much less than five millimetres in length. They're shown here in red. You might imagine that the big difference in spur lengths with no intermediates would suggest that they have very different pollinator guilds. But in fact, they hybridise relatively frequently. So they obviously aren't strong sterility barriers between these different tanks. If you look at the distribution of some of the more prominent species across Europe, it soon becomes evident that the short spurred species specialise in mountain and boreal habitats. So if you look at the so-called nigritellas, for example, shown here in red, you find that they're in the Alps, the Carpathians, the Pyrenees, with outliers in Scandinavia. Gymnodenia borealis, on the other hand, is shown here as endemic to Britain and Ireland, which on current evidence it is, although there are possible candidates for populations of borealis along the Norwegian coast and also in Portugal. Those need further research. Unfortunately, what I wasn't able to do with this diagram was to distinguish between Canopsia and Densiflora, that is between the chalk fragrant orchid and the marsh fragrant orchid. And that's because in the majority of European countries, they're either not distinguished at all or they're distinguished at the varietal level and therefore not adequately mapped. When people started doing molecular work on these plants a quarter of a century ago, using relatively straightforward genetic regions that yielded few distinguishing characters. This is the kind of tree that we began to produce. And it contained some surprises. In particular, uh, perhaps we weren't so surprised that Canopsia, Borealis and Densiflora came out strongly as distinct species. It's very easy to distinguish them on the basis of DNA data. Uh, there was perhaps a bit of a surprise that uh, using this method we were unable to distinguish Canopsia from the continental Adraptissima, but the real surprise was that Canopsia, Densiflora and Borealis, the three British and Irish species, are not each other's closest relatives. Interspersed between them were speciation events that generated some of the short spurred taxa, the montane taxa. So it suggests you might have thought, for example, that Borealis and Densiflora evolved from within Canopsia, but this turns out not to be the case. 
On the other hand, for the purposes of our talk here, the key thing is that the genetic data, even fairly simple genetic data, are showing strongly that Canopsia borealis and Densiflora are different species. More recently, much more sophisticated DNA-based techniques have been brought to bear on this problem. Uh, RADSEQ, for example, generated 18,000 variable sites within the genome that allowed us to compare these species. And what was quite reassuring about the outcome of this study was that the same species were recognized by this more sophisticated method. And again, it shows the Densiflora borealis and Canopsia separated species, uh, separate species, and it also shows that they're separated by Schwartzberg taxa. However, it suggests that the species evolved in the opposite sequence from the previous molecular studies. So we're confident about where the species boundaries, boundaries lie. We're confident the Densiflora borealis and Canopsia are not each other's closest relatives, but we're not totally confident about the order in which they evolved or about who evolved from whom. Those questions will require further study. Now, a lot of this talk, particularly the second of the two halves of the talk, is based on multivariate ordinations. It's based on the statistical technique that allows us to take lots of different characters, lots of different morphological variables, and analyze them to produce a single diagram. And here I've chosen a hypothetical example just to show roughly how the system works. So <clears throat> if you imagine here that we've got labellum length, labellum width, and leaf width as three of maybe 40 or more characters that Ian Denham and I have been measuring for the last quarter century. In this particular case, we've looked at two putative species and measured them for the 40 characters, simultaneously analyzed those characters, and that means that all of the plants that we've measured then get ordinated in what's known as multivariate hyperspace, then they get projected down onto a single plane, which effectively gives you a graph showing how similar each plant is to each other plant, and also telling you which of the characters are most effective for separating the plants, separating the populations, and hopefully separating the species that you're attempting to study. So in this particular case, it looks as though labellum length has turned out to be a really useful character for separating taxon A from taxon B. Labellum width has given us some useful information, but seemingly less powerful as a discriminator than labellum length. And in this case, leaf width hasn't provided us with much discriminatory information at all. So we're looking to take very large bodies of information from loads of plants, loads of characters, boil them all down to a single graph, and then work out which of the characters is contributing most to that graph. And here's an example of such a plot. This particular plot is based on 41 characters. As you can see, a large number of plants measured. And this encompasses a wide range of species from across Europe. So we're not just looking at the British and Irish taxa at this particular point. But you can see that there are three different groups that one could recognize here. In the top left of this diagram are the so-called nigritellas, which combine a small plant with a large flower, a large labellum in particular. In the bottom left-hand corner of this diagram, we've got the boreal and montane species, which have small flowers and small spurs, such as Odoratissima and Frivaldii. And then over on the right, we've got the British taxa, which have smaller flowers than the nigritellas, larger flowers than the boreal and montane taxa, with particularly long spurs. And if you look at the contributing characters, which are listed in order of contribution to these two axes, you can see that lip length is the dominant character on the vertical axis, and spur length and the presence of sinuses 
the gaps that break up the lip into three different lobes are the main contributors on the horizontal axis, but there are many other characters as well that help separate the British taxa from the continental taxa on that first horizontal axis. And we'll look at several diagrams of this kind in relation to the British and Irish taxa in the second part of this talk. So we find ourselves in a rather unusual situation where we can readily separate the three British and Irish species of Gymnodenia using DNA. We can do it fairly effectively using habitat preference. We can do it fairly effectively using flowering period. But if we want to use classical morphology of the kind that we find in our floras, a, we're going to need to apply a fine scale ruler because the differences are very subtle. And B, we know we're going to struggle to separate these taxa and we're going to have to think about it pretty carefully. On the other hand, we can be confident that it can be done. Here we go back as far as 1996 and publication of the flora of Hampshire. This uh, in this particular flora, the distributions of the Gymnodenia were largely dictated by Francis Rose, who'd paid particular attention to the genus. He was very interested in it. Um, indeed, it was Francis who produced the treatment of Gymnodenia for the plant crib, uh, which was in turn used by Stace in his flora. So Francis Rose had a good idea about how to use morphology to distinguish the three British and Irish species. On the left, uh, and in fact, you can use these maps to pick out the different habitats. So on the left, we see Canopsia sensu stricto, the chalk fragrant orchid, and it shows beautifully the escarpment, the chalk escarpment, running through the middle of Hampshire from east to west. If you look at the distribution of Densiflora in the central one of these maps, you can see that the distribution of Densiflora largely follows the course of some of the chalk streams, and the occasional calcareous flush. And then if you look at Borealis, the right-hand diagram here, the heath fragrant orchid, not only does it pick out the new forest here towards the bottom left of Hampshire, but it also picks out one particular geological stratum around the margin of the new forest that appears to be particularly suitable for Borealis. So they are mappable using morphology if you know exactly what to look for. Unfortunately, most of the people who have contributed data to the plant atlases of Britain and Ireland have not had that knowledge. So here we see the distribution maps from the 2002 plant atlas for Britain and Ireland. In the uppermost of these distribution maps, you can see the distribution of Canopsia, Canopsia sensulato, in other words, all three species lumped together. And you can see that overall this group of species is pretty widespread across Britain and Ireland. But if you look at the individual maps for Borealis, Canopsia and Densiflora, which at the time were viewed as subspecies of Canopsia, you'll see that relatively little effort or confidence has gone into mapping them. So if we look at the left-hand diagram here, it looks as though Borealis is concentrated in the New Forest, Cornwall, a little bit in the Welsh mountains, and a few, few sites distributed across Scotland. Canopsia sensi stricto is on parts of the English chalk, but even this isn't mapped particularly well. And then Densiflora, similarly scattered across uh, the British Isles, doesn't barely appears to exist in Ireland. And you can see that these maps are horribly under-researched and under-mapped. These taxa are poorly mapped. Now I've been able to generate from up-to-date information in the BSBI database the, the maps or something very close to the maps that will appear in the 2022 plant atlas. As you'd expect, the map for Canopsia sensulato at the top here hasn't changed a great deal since 2002. Maybe the species has been lost from one or two areas, but 
basically it still looks pretty widespread. If we look at the map of Borealis on the bottom left, we now begin to see a much more accurate picture where, yes, it's still in the New Forest, yes, it's still in Cornwall, but it's clearly concentrated in the north, northern England, northern Ireland, and really dominant in Scotland. Densiflora on the bottom right of this diagram still looks pretty scattered across the British Isles, still looks to me somewhat under-recorded, um, particularly in Ireland where in my, it's my impression that Densiflora is the most frequent of the three species. And then it, at this point in time it's Canopsia sensi stricto that raises some of the questions. Uh, my impression here is that it is over recorded in Ireland and over recorded in Scotland where I've yet to be shown evidence, concrete evidence, that Canopsia sensi stricto occurs in Scotland. So the maps are much improved over the last 20 years but they're still far from perfect. There are also a couple of complicating factors that we need to take into account here. The first are some late flowering plants that nonetheless occur on downland where you'd expect them to be early flowering. In Sussex, uh, they've also been reported in Hampshire and may well occur elsewhere in the British Isles. They look as though they probably belong to Gymnodenia densiflora. But, uh, and indeed as long ago as 2001, David Lang suggested that as a subspecies, these Sussex populations probably do belong to Densiflora. But there's a second complicating factor, more recently identified, of late flowering populations that occur in dune slacks at Kemfig and other dune systems in South Wales. And they too look rather like Densiflora, and they also look rather like the plants that I showed in the previous PowerPoint slide. And when visiting South Wales, uh, continental orchidologist Carol Kreutz suggested that he'd seen similar plants on the Frisian islands offshore from the Netherlands, Denmark and Germany, which he had described to Gymnodenia canopsia sensi stricto as var frisica, along with Les Lewis. And the following year, Les Lewis very wisely transferred var frisica from Canopsia sensi stricto to Densiflora. So we're left with two populations in downland and dunes that are late flowering. That fits in with Densiflora. But you've also got the additional question of whether either or both of these populations are the same thing that one finds in the Frisian islands, in which case one might reasonably describe them as Frisica. And here in the last slide of this part of the talk, we return to the original DNA-based evolutionary tree and take a closer look at the samples of Densiflora that have been included in this analysis. And if we blow up the Densiflora part of the tree, what we see is that those South Wales Densifloras and the plants from late flowering plants from downland in southern England in Sussex form a unified group here at the bottom. They're a single evolutionary entity, which we may well think about ascribing to Frisica, but because they are genetically distinct, we might well think of them as a subspecies. So up until now, it looked as though we were dealing with three taxa. Canopsia sensi stricto, Borealis and Densiflora, but now we have an additional complicating factor to take into account, which is these populations that may or may not be ascribable to Frisica. For the sake of argument, we will refer to them as Frisica for the rest of this talk. And that's where we stand going into the second part of this talk, where we ask in greater detail the question, can we use morphology? to separate at least the three species and possibly this subspecies as well.